The subject for today's lecture is the Gothic, <clears throat> which is the dominant style of the Middle Ages in Europe. The term Gothic was coined by Giorgio Vasari, the artist and writer in Florence in the Renaissance. It was intended as a derogatory term. The Italians didn't like the style that emerged in France, England, and Germany very much. I thought it was barbaric. Uh, at the time in the Middle Ages, the people who practiced the Gothic style didn't call themselves Gothic. They called themselves modernists or practitioners of the international style, both similar to uh, labels from the 20th century in architecture. In fact, in the Renaissance, they called themselves modernists, too. They didn't call themselves Renaissance. Uh, there's, uh, in the 19th century, you have the Gothic Revival, which is a reaction to industry and a nostalgia for the Middle Ages. And in the 20th century, you have the Goth, which is also in opposition to... Uh, the development of industry and technology, and a nostalgia for the Middle Ages. <clears throat> in the early Middle Ages, you had the Romanesque style. This is the uh, church of Saint-Denis, just north of Paris. The early part of the church is Romanesque. So you have heavy pier buttresses, P-I-E-R, buttresses buttresses that are just attached as piers to the walls. Let's say uh, uh, typically Romanesque attribute. Then you have the uh, entrances, the doors. Above the doors are relief sculptures called tympana. The tympanum usually has the last judgment on it uh, to uh, warn people of the uh, uh, consequences of sin. Uh, the the tympanum develops in the Romanesque church. Uh, up above in the center, you have a rose window. The rose window is a symbol of Mary. Then the three arches are a symbol of the Trinity. <clears throat> so all this is uh, pretty common in the Romanesque. The Gothic begins uh, in the early 11th century. Uh, some would argue that it begins here at the Church of Saint-Denis. Other people would argue that it begins at Durham Cathedral in England. At Durham, the very first ribs are placed on the surface of the vault. So that's a particularly Gothic element. Here at Saint-Denis, the very first light is allowed into the altar so that the architecture is dematerialized. <clears throat> so that's a particularly Gothic element. The Gothic also involves pointed arches or ogival arches and stained glass windows. <clears throat> this church is dedicated to one of the patron saints of France, Saint Denis. He had his head cut off by the Romans and he carried his head to this site north of Paris. Uh, while the kings were away in the Crusades, the abbot of the church, Abbot Suger, S-U-G-E-R, uh, did some reconstruction on the inside uh, around the altar in the ambulatory. He knocked down the old thick Roman walls of the Romanesque church, which made the inside very dark, and he replaced them with lots of stained glass and very thin columns and webbed vaults. So he dematerialized the architecture, allowed light to flood in, and gave the architecture a kind of a structural logic <clears throat> that uh, derived from nature that didn't exist in the Romanesque architecture. So this is considered by many to be the beginning of the Gothic. Uh, the abbot Suger may have been inspired by the writings of the philosopher Pseudo-Dionysus from the Middle Ages. Pseudo-Dionysus was interested in light mysticism, the idea that uh, light uh, represents the presence of God, 
So the more light there is, the more God is present. So that may have inspired uh, the abbot Suget to fill the altar and the ambulatory of Saint-Denis with uh, as much light as he could. There's the, uh, the ribbing uh, in the vault, which uh, occurs a bit later. Uh, Durham was about 10 years prior to this. The ribbing uh, is a geometrical articulation that has uh, no particular structural function, uh, usually, uh, in the vault. So it's uh, called handwriting by historians. It's a, a geometry that's applied to the structure of the building. And that's a particular Gothic characteristic. Chartres Cathedral is one of the most famous Gothic cathedrals uh, in the world. <clears throat> it's outside of Paris. It has a Romanesque facade with the pier buttresses, a rose window. There's a row of uh, statues above the rose window called the King's Gallery. There are three windows below the rose window for the Trinity towers which don't match. Most of these cathedrals were built over periods of hundreds of years by several different generations, uh, interrupted by wars and things like that. So it's di difficult to uh, have a final homogeneous design in the cathedral. We're looking at the uh, west uh, facade of the cathedral. Most cathedrals, uh, the altar faces east towards Jerusalem. The west portal, or royal portal, the entrance on the west end at Chartres, is the most famous portal or door in Gothic architecture. It's considered to be the most complex iconographic program in the history of architecture. Iconographic means having to do with signs and symbols. So you have the three tympana. In the center tympanum is Christ in judgment with the four evangelists represented by the four animals, the uh, ox for Luke, the angel for Matthew, the eagle for John, and the winged lion for Mark. On the left, you have the uh, ascension and resurrection of Christ. On the right, you have uh, Christ and Mary as lawgivers, called the sede sapientiae, the seat of wisdom. And above, uh, below each tympanum, there's a king's gallery with a line of uh, figures. And then in the uh, archivolts up above the tympanum are uh, lots of other figures from the Bible. There's also figures attached to the jams uh, down below the uh, lintels there. <clears throat> so this is the, uh, the right portal or the right tympanum. Uh, just to give an example of how complex the iconography is. Uh, you have uh, figures that represent the uh, seven liberal arts, which are the uh, educational system of scholasticism, which is the dominant philosophy of the Middle Ages. <clears throat> the seven liberal arts consist of the trivium and the quadrivium, or the trivium or the higher arts, connected to noetic thinking from Plato, Platonic philosophy. Uh, they are grammar, rhetoric, and uh, logic, uh, all of which are present there. I see grammar, there's dialectic as logic, so grammar, rhetoric, and dialectic. Those are the three higher arts of the trivium uh, corresponding to the trinity and the uh, arts that are connected to intelligible thinking. And then you have the four uh, lower arts of the quadrivium, geometry, mathematics, uh, up at the top there, astronomy, and uh, music are the uh, four elements of the quadrivium. Those are the lower arts, four, as always, corresponding to the material world. Those are the arts connected to sense perception and discursive thinking uh, in relation to the divided line of Plato. So that was the extent of the educational system in the Middle Ages. You were offered uh, the, one of the seven liberal arts uh, at the monastery, and you studied that in preparation for a profession. So in addition are present a, a number of uh, 
classical philosophers. There's Euclid, the inventor of geometry, Boethius, uh, a, a Roman philosopher, Ptolemy, a Greek astronomer, uh, Priscian, Pythagoras down there uh, in the lower right, and Aristotle in the lower left, and Cicero, the Roman writer, on the left. So uh, clearly the uh, pagan or classical philosophy is being interwoven with Catholic theology here, uh, which is something you associate with the Renaissance, not so much with the Gothic, but it's clearly present here. So uh, scholasticism, uh, the education of the scholasticism is the seven liberal arts. Uh, the uh, writing of scholasticism is the summa, which means summary. Books were written as summas. The most famous one is the Summa Theologica of Thomas Aquinas. Uh, a summa had uh, all kinds of subdivisions and parts. They were very detailed. They had chapters and subchapters, which didn't exist in uh, classical writing. So uh, there's a theory that there may be a correspondence between the subdivisions and details of the Gothic uh, architecture and the subdivision and details of the scholastic summa. There's Aristotle and Pythagoras uh, down in the lower right corner. Uh, the program was probably dictated by the head of the, the school at Chartres. His name was Thierry of Chartres. He was a Platonic philosopher teaching at the cathedral school. Uh, he wrote this book, the commentary on the De Arithmetica of Boethius. The cathedral, cathedral schools were important predecessors to the very first universities, which uh, came up uh, in, about 100 years later in the 12th century, or at the end of the uh, 11th century. Paris being one of the first of them at Oxford also. Uh, Erwin Panofsky, an art historian who was from Germany, came to the United States, was active at the Institute of Fine Arts at Princeton University for a long time, wrote a very influential book called Gothic Architecture and Scholasticism, uh, where he proposed the idea that uh, you could explain all of the intricate subdivisions of uh, Gothic architecture in relation to the intricate subdivisions of the uh, writing in the Summa, the Scholastic Summa. Uh, the Gothic architects uh, believed uh, that uh, God created the world uh, as an architect, just like in the Timaeus of Plato. There's a, this is a cover of a moralized Bible in a museum in Paris that shows God creating the universe. Uh, as an architect with a compass. Uh, and so the building was seen as a microcosm of the design of the cosmos. And uh, so in both Rom Romanesque and Gothic architecture, you will still find uh, lots of examples of uh, mathematical proportions like the golden ratio and the Pythagorean harmonies and the uh, geometries that correspond to the uh, polyhedral atomic uh, geometries described by Plato and the Timaeus. This is a, there's only one uh, lodge book or sketchbook surviving from the Gothic world. Uh, the lodges were uh, <clears throat> the uh, masons. There was no architecture school or anything like that. If you wanted to build a building, you joined a lodge uh, or a, a, a mason's guild and you worked your way up through the Masons Guild uh, to become the master, and your work would be called the Masterpiece. That's where that idea comes from. The only lodge book surviving is from a Mason named Villard de Onicor, who worked at Rem Cathedral. Uh, and it shows how uh, all of the sculpture and all of the figures have an underlying geometrical structure. So uh, the typical uh, elevation in a French cathedral, this is Amiens Cathedral. The vault is a quadripartite vault, meaning that each bay is divided into four parts by a uh, X uh, rib or a cross rib 
So you have the ribs forming the X, and they form the four parts of the vault. That's called a quadripartite vault. The areas between the ribs are called severies. <clears throat> the ribs crossing the vault sit on poles, which run all the way up the elevation. Those are called springer poles. Uh, some here, uh, the back springer pole runs all the way up where the springer poles in the foreground uh, only start at the top of the bundle columns at the bottom there. So the uh, elevation is always divided into three parts. The bottom part is called the arcade. Then the middle part is called the triforium. And the windows up above are the clear story windows, just like an Egyptian, Egyptian hypostyle temple. So here, the arches and the arcade have multiple archivolts or uh, lines in the arch. They're supported by bundle columns. Uh, the triforium features a colonnade supporting an arcade. Then you have the very high clear story windows at uh, Amiens. This is the highest vault ever built uh, in the world. The French tried to build the cathedrals higher and higher. Then you have the rose window symbolizing Mary. And then the uh, lancet windows, they're called below the rose window. Uh, with the uh, caming iron bars that the glass is set in uh, and to uh, illuminate the church and suggest the presence of God. <clears throat> this is Durham Cathedral, which uh, the vaults were constructed about 10 years before uh, saint in the early 11th century. Durham is uh, in northeastern England. It's not far from the coast and the border with Scotland. It's on the River Weir, uh, so it hovers over the river. It's a beautiful cathedral. It uh, houses the relics of uh, uh, the uh, Saint Cuthbert. Cuthbert was an Irish priest who established a colony on the island of Lindisfarne, just off the coast in northeastern England which is the very first uh, Christian colony in England. So this, this church was built to house his relics. So in the choir, the rib appears on the vault for the very first time. Uh, this didn't exist in Roman architecture or Romanesque architecture. It's a quadripartite vault, just like in France. A tripart elevation, just like in France. The rib has no structural function, so it's uh, not quite clear what the purpose of it was, but it became the most defining element of Gothic architecture. Actually, I went to Durham a couple of years ago and presented a paper at a conference on how I thought that the uh, these geometries that were introduced into the architecture were inspired by the Timaeus of Plato. Durham is uh, famous for its cylindrical columns with, with its Celtic geometries. The arches are round arches. It's a, it's a Romanesque church other than the ribs and the vault. So the arches are round. They're lined with dog tooth molding there. So you see the Springer pole running up, supporting the ribs that cross the vault there. You see the quadripartite vaults in each bay. And then you see the arcade, the triforium, and the clear story, and the elevation. All stock elements of the uh, Romanesque and Gothic church. <clears throat> there, in, the, uh, in the center of the bay, the uh, ribs uh, aren't on a springer pole. They're just on a corbel. The thing on top of the springer pole is called a corbel. And uh, in the center of the bay there, the corbel is just uh, attached to the middle of the spandrel between the arches. The area between the arches is called the spandrel. There's uh, one of the uh, cylindrical columns with the Celtic geometries. And then there's an effigy of uh, St. Cuthbert, whose relics are in the cathedral down there. There's uh, ribs also in the vaults and the aisles overlapping uh, arches in the aisles <clears throat> are a detail from Islamic architecture. There's actually a lot of influence of Islamic architecture and uh, English Gothic and Romanesque architecture. <clears throat> 
There's the crypt at Durham, really nice uh, bookstore and souvenir shop. You can go shopping. And there's a really nice cafe down there too. A kind of umbrella column with ribs springing from cylindrical bolts holding up the bottom of the church. The famous knocker on the door. Uh, the cathedral uh, housed uh, people who had been committed a crime. If you were, if you were accused of committing a crime, uh, you could seek refuge in the cathedral before your trial. There's me visiting the cathedral, dressed up like a Benedictine monk. Uh, the monasteries were destroyed by Henry VIII in England, so there are no monasteries anymore. But they still let you dress up like a monk if you want. There's the close. The close is the area, the grassy area that the cathedral faces. Uh, all cathedrals in England uh, face grassy areas called closes. <clears throat> There's uh, the town in Durham. There's the hotel where I stayed, King's Lodge Inn. Had fantastic food. They they say that the best food in England is in Durham, and I, I definitely think that's true. Had some very nice food. Uh, I've been there a couple times, but uh, I enjoy visiting there very much. So the first Gothic cathedral in England is Canterbury Cathedral in Kent in southeastern England. Uh, we're looking at a, a later, uh, uh, the nave is from the later Gothic period, the decorated period. Uh, the earliest, earliest uh, part of the cathedral are the uh, the altar area and the choir at the east end of the cathedral in the back there. So this is the uh, choir area uh, with the altar. This is uh, the first uh, Gothic architecture to appear in England. Uh, the architect's name was William of Sens uh, from uh, France. He was French. Uh, although this departs from the French approach to Gothic architecture, he, uh, while construction was underway, he fell off scaffolding and died, and was replaced by an architect named William the Englishman, <coughs> who, who uh, departed even further from the Gothic prototype. William the Englishman was assisted by an architect named Geoffrey de Noyers, N-O-Y-E-R-S, who uh, afterwards would go up to Lincoln and do the architecture there. So these are masons, uh, although sometimes people call them architects, although there wasn't really such a thing as architecture still. The uh, bishop of the cathedral was Anselm of Cather Canterbury, who was referred to as the father of scholasticism in England, wrote some very influential books. Uh, the construction was... Uh, 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 what's the word, uh, described uh, in a journal by a monk at Canterbury named Gervais of Canterbury. So more is known about the construction of uh, Canterbury Cathedral than any other cathedral. Uh, in the uh, 11th century, the uh, Archbishop of Canterbury, Canterbury was the head church of the uh, Roman Catholic Church in England, the archbishop was uh, a guy named Thomas Beckett. Thomas Beckett was murdered uh, in the altar of the cathedral by the king, uh, Henry VII. <clears throat> uh, and it was a very famous murder, so a uh, shrine to Thomas Beckett was built as part of the uh, new architecture. The, the shrine to Thomas Beckett became the most important uh, pilgrimage destination in England uh, and especially uh, from London so uh, hundreds of pilgrimage, pilgrims would make the trip from London to Canterbury this is all recounted in the Canterbury Tales by Geoffrey Chaucer uh, the uh, assassination of Thomas Becket resulted in the drafting of the Magna Carta one of the most famous documents in history uh, which uh, declares that the church is separate from the state. <coughs> and that became an important basis of the American Constitution. There are five copies of the Magna Carta. One is at Canterbury, one is at Salisbury, one's at Lincoln, one's in the British Library in London, and one is uh, continuously traveling through the United States. <coughs> 
So uh, the architecture uh, still has the French uh, quadripartite vault, although with some uh, variations. That's actually a sexpartite vault in the second bay there uh, with the, uh, the six severies in between the ribs. Uh, the ribs sit on uh, brown, dark brown springer poles. That's a perfect stone that's uh, unique to English cathedrals. And then the springer poles uh, sit on the uh, capitals of the columns. You have ogival arches and the arcade. Uh, and then uh, lots of columns, Purbeck columns and arches in the uh, Triforium. There's uh, uh, the uh, shrine to Thomas Becket called Becket's Crown. Uh, it has a lot of stained glass, which is unusual for an English cathedral. It has Purbeck springer poles running up the elevation, supporting the ribs and the vault. This is a view looking back uh, through the choir and uh, out towards the uh, nave. Actually, this is the retro choir behind the choir. Then you have the choir, then you have the nave uh, from a much later period. There's actually, when I visited the cathedral, there was a uh, graduation going on. The University of Kent was having their graduation, so I wasn't able to uh, visit the nave on that day. Uh, in the aisle, there's uh, the quadripartite vault, which is supported by uh, thin, thin columns that are uh, separated out uh, from the wall. So you actually have a kind of independent space frame forming the columns and the vault there, which becomes more and more popular in the development of Gothic architecture in England. Then there's some variations on the quadripartite vault with an additional rib inserted in the center of the vault. Uh, on the exterior of the aisle. And then the transepts, uh, which are the, the, it's a Latin cross church, so you have the nave and then the transept is the horizontal bar crossing close to the altar. The transepts were by William the Englishman, uh, and they are very sort of odd uh, and out of proportion, where we see in, in, that, in that example some of the arches are squished <clears throat> to make room for the round arch in the center. So he takes all kinds of liberties and experiments uh, with the uh, French Gothic architecture. There's a, right in the center there, there's a springer pole that's just not sitting on anything. There's a kind of a little corbel on the ledge there, but there's no severy, there's no column, there's uh, nothing supporting the springer pole there. So it must have appeared as very odd. So then the first fully Gothic cathedral is Lincoln Cathedral. This is uh, Lincoln Cathedral is in northern England. It's all lit up here. It was uh, actually very effectively used during World War II as a beacon for uh, bomber pilots returning from Germany uh, to airstrips in northern England. <coughs> uh, it was built uh, originally by William the Conqueror in the Norman invasion in 1066. It was, uh, when the tower was completed there, it was the tallest building in the world, and it remained uh, that way for 300 years. Uh, Lincoln is uh, a Celtic word. Uh, Lynn means a pool, and a dun means a hill, Linden, or Lincoln. So there's the pool, and there's the hill with the cathedral on it. Uh, there's uh, swans. Uh, this is uh, right in front of the University of Lincoln. Uh, I was employed as a research professor at the University of Lincoln for eight years from 2007 to 2015. So I didn't teach any classes there, but I uh, visited it almost every couple of months. <clears throat> Walked by these spot swans on the way to the university. All swans are property of the Queen of England, so you, you uh, can't touch them. Uh, you wouldn't want to anyway, they're pretty nasty. So the uh, entrance to the cathedral is the only part remaining from the Romanesque cathedral built by William the Conqueror with the round arches there. The rest of it is all Gothic and it was built very quickly from about 1185 to 1260. So a pretty uh, amazingly quick construction for a Gothic cathedral. The uh, bishop, when the Gothic part was begun, was Hugh of Avalon, 
Saint Hugh. He's the only bishop ever to become a saint. Steep Hill Road uh, takes you up to the medieval part of Lincoln, the town of Lincoln. You go by the uh, oldest house. And <coughs> and, excuse me. In England, on the left there, make your way up to the cathedral. It's a very steep uh, uh, road. I was always out of breath by the time I got up to the top. Up at the top, there's the uh, the Tudor framed building is a tourist center. Brown's Pie Shop is just to the left there. Uh, you, they have an excellent rabbit pie. I recommend the rabbit pie. Can't find that very much in the United States. Then around the corner to the right is the cathedral. You go through the Exchequer Gate, where taxes were collected, and you enter the cathedral close. Uh, there's a statue of uh, Lord Alfred Tennyson. He's from Lincoln. He was the poet laureate of England during the Victorian period. <clears throat> He's the second most quoted writer in the English language after William Shakespeare. It's better to have loved and lost than to have, uh, what is it? It's better to have loved and lost than to have ever loved at all, I think. There's the pub in front of the cathedral. <coughs> in front of the cathedral, named after the Magna Carta. I spent, I spent many pleasant afternoons sitting at the table there, drinking beer. Uh, studying the uh, cathedral. A view from the cathedral, there's the Exchequer Gate, and in the distance there is the castle built by William the Conqueror. <clears throat> it has a prison on the left there, and law courts in the center. And then uh, Lincolnshire is off uh, in the distance. Lincolnshire is uh, right next to Nottinghamshire, uh, the forest where Robin Hood roamed around is right at the edge of Lincoln. In fact, the uh, the uh, green dye that Robin Hood wore is called Lincoln Green. It was manufactured in Lincoln. So the uh, earliest part of the cathedral is by the mason Geoffrey de Noyer, who came up from Canterbury. Uh, he was working for uh, St. Hugh of Lincoln. So there's lots of Purbeck marble. Like at Canterbury, there's a sex sexpartite vault. Like at Canterbury, the arcade, the triforium, and the clear story. <coughs> this is the uh, main transept of the cathedral. Uh, and then uh, Geoffrey de Noyer designed the choir, which is called St. Hugh's Choir. Uh, it has the uh, tripartite elevation, the arcade, the triforium, and the clear story. The Purbeck Springer poles uh, start on corbels in the spandrels between the arches and the arcade and run up to spandrels in the triforium. The clear story, each bay is divided into three lancet windows. And then you have a very unusual ribbed vault, uh, like nothing that's ever been seen in architecture before. It has a pole running down the center. Uh, that's called the ridge pole. And then it has uh, a very strange organization of ribs, which is organization of ribs, which is actually asymmetrical. <clears throat> it's the only asymmetrical vault uh, ever built in the history of the ar history of architecture. Historians refer to it as the crazy vault uh, because they can't make any sense out of it. Why in the world would you build an asymmetrical vault? It's called a scissor vault, uh, where uh, three ribs uh, meet. Uh, along the ridge pole, the intersection of the ribs are covered by what are called bosses, which is about a foot diameter floral pattern covering over the intersection of the ribs. And so the scissors alternate back and forth at each bay, creating an asymmetrical vault. So you have the three lancet windows in the clear story and the three ribs uh, meeting in the scissor vault uh, along the ridge pole in, the, in each bay. <clears throat> and then the areas between the ribs are the severies. Uh, in medieval times, that would just be exposed brick. Uh, nowadays, it's uh, covered, painted over with uh, plaster and stucco 
was part of the Victorian restoration, restorations. So uh, a different kind of rib is introduced here, a rib which uh, doesn't cross the entire vault. It only goes halfway across, <clears throat> and it doesn't do anything structurally. Uh, that's called a tierceron, which is a French word meaning third arm. So it's a uh, an additional kind of a rib that's an additional kind of handwriting that doesn't do anything structurally, but is, uh, it has to be there for a purpose, and nobody's quite sure what that is. That was the reason why I was hired by the university, uh, based on my work on my dissertation in interpreting Borromini's architecture. Uh, they thought that I could figure out uh, why uh, this kind of architecture came about. Uh, why is the vault asymmetrical? Why is there an additional rib that doesn't do anything structurally, etc.? So, so I uh, spent eight years uh, trying to figure this out. <clears throat> uh, I read, uh, when I started, I read a lot of the work of Robert Gross Test, who became uh, the bishop of the cathedral shortly after this was completed. Uh, Robert Gross Test is uh, one of the most important philosophers of the Middle Ages. Uh, he's not very well known. You probably haven't heard of him. But he was the first chancellor of Oxford University which uh, was just getting started uh, before he became Bishop of Lincoln. Uh, he wrote the uh, first uh, commentary and translations on Aristotle uh, in Latin. He did the first full translations of uh, Pseudo-Dionysus. He wrote uh, the first cosmology since the Timaeus of Plato. So it's been a good 2,000 years. And Grosteste wrote a cosmology just like Plato had written. It was gross test cosmology was called on light or de luce in Latin. He wrote a second cosmology called on lines, angles, and figures, or de lineus, uh, angulus, and figurus. <clears throat> These were written while he was still at Oxford before he became Bishop of Lincoln. When I read these cosmologies, uh, he describes the formation of matter from light. So just like in the classical world, the ancient world, all matter comes from light, according to Gross Test. There are two kinds of light. There's the spiritual light and the physical light. The spiritual light corresponds to intelligible thinking. It can be understood but not perceived. Gross Test called that the virtues intellectiva. Uh, and so the uh, spiritual light uh, created the, the intelligible form, or the spiritual form, uh, in the mind's eye, which Gross Test called the specius apprehensibilis, uh, or specius is form in Latin, apprehensibilis is intelligible form. So Gross Test thought that there was a mirror in the eye, a, peril, a pineal gland, just like Descartes did in the 17th century, that uh, formed the intelligible image or the intelligible form. So the specius apprehensibilis is synonymous with the eidos. They're exactly the same thing. The eidos from classical philosophy is the specius apprehensibilis in scholasticism. Uh, and the oculus mentis is the eye of the mind. So that's the, the pineal gland. So, uh, so how does, what does this have to do with the architecture? So in the cosmology, De Luce, Grosses described how uh, light uh, uh, became matter through geometries. And he described a series of geometries uh, in order to transmit the light into the matter. Uh, various kinds of lines that are uh, bent and reflected and refracted, uh, curved surfaces, uh, cone shapes, <clears throat> and as I read these, uh, it became uh, pretty evident to me that the, the geometries that started to appear in the architecture of Lincoln Cathedral that had no precedent whatsoever were uh, exactly the same as the geometries that uh, Gross Tess was describing uh, in his uh, cosmology, his treatise on light. So uh, it became clear to me that uh, the Gothic Cathedral was no different from uh, the uh, Egyptian or classical building. It's a catechism, a three-dimensional model of uh, knowledge or an edificium, a teaching device uh, 
uh, to model the uh, cosmology or the cosmolo cosmological structure of the universe that was, uh, as it was understood by the scholastics at the time. So I ended up, the, the book that I wrote based on the research ended up being called Architecture as Cosmology. That seemed to me the core idea that, that we're looking at a catechism of a cosmology. So the uh, three lancet windows at each bay, which transform the spiritual light <clears throat> to the physical light, correspond to the trinity. And in my opinion, the reason why the vault is asymmetrical is so that in each bay you could have three ribs meeting uh, at the ridge pole uh, so that the uh, uh, geometry of the three ribs could uh, correspond to the uh, geometry and mathematics of the three lancet windows and the clear story window so it would be clear uh, that this is a uh, both a mathematical and a geometrical structure representing the formation of matter from light <clears throat> so that's that was my explanation as to why the vault is asymmetrical and why these uh, new vocabulary elements like the ridge bowl, the boss, and the tercerron that we're looking at here appear out of nowhere. There's no precedent for them anywhere in architecture. There's no explanation for them. So my explanation was based on Robert Gross Test's cosmology. Uh, the next part of the cathedral to be built was the nave. Uh, it was uh, by now Gross Test is the Bishop of Lincoln. Uh, the nave might look familiar if you saw the movie The Da Vinci Code that was filmed in Lincoln Cathedral. The action actually takes place in Westminster Abbey, but they couldn't get permission to film in Westminster Abbey, so they filmed it here in Lincoln Cathedral. And that's a good example of how the architecture of Lincoln Cathedral becomes the precedent for all architecture in England for a, a good 500 years. Uh, which I would like to uh, show in my lecture on English Gothic architecture. So in the nave you have uh, bundles of Purbeck columns supporting uh, arches with multiple archivolts, then springer poles uh, springing from corbels and the spandrels between the arches and the arcade. Then you have the triforium and the clear story. <clears throat> and then you have uh, multiple tiercerons in each bay. There are seven, I think, thick tiercerons in each bay, springing from sort of cone-shaped uh, bundles of ribs on top of the corbels, on top of the springer poles. Uh, the cone shape is another geometry that appears in Gross Test Cosmology de Luce. And then in between the ribs, you have a shorter rib, or in between the bays, you have a shorter rib that uh, connects the tiercerons to the ridge pole. That's called a lierne. L-I-E-R-N-E, -E, another French word. So in the nave, you have more additional uh, vocabulary elements added to the architecture that have no precedent and never existed anywhere before. And they also have no structural function. They're just handwriting. Uh, they're just there, uh, in my opinion. Some, some would say it's just decoration. Uh, I would say it's a geometry for the purpose of uh, allowing the building to be a catechism for the cosmology. Uh, it's always important to remember that in the cathedral, the vault is not the roof. Uh, there's a timber roof above the vault. Uh, in fact, when you visit Lincoln Cathedral, you can actually walk on top of the vault up above. So it's not the real structure. Uh, it's also important to remember that, that this whole structural system that we're looking at with the uh, columns supporting the springer poles, supporting the ribs and the vault, it's not the actual structural system. The vault is actually supported by uh, buttresses that are hidden uh, uh, outside of the uh, aisles on either side there. So this entire system that we're structural system that we're looking at is fake. Uh, so you know you think of Plato and the allegory of the cave and what you see is deceptive and the real real structure is not present, just like in the Pantheon or the Parthenon. <clears throat> and this continues in the Renaissance and buildings like St. Peter's and St. Andre in Mantua, <clears throat> where what appears to be the structure of the building is not the structure. That's not the real uh, roof. That's not the real structure. Uh, the, the, the architecture is always already working metaphorically or as a trope. Uh, so the vault would be a trope for the body of Christ uh, that protects you. Uh, the, the nave 
nave means ship, so the architecture is a trope or a metaphor for the uh, uh, ship, Noah's Ark, that saves you. So it's already a metaphorical architecture, tropic architecture. Like the, the skeleton would be a metonym, not a metaphor. <clears throat> and then you have this uh, additional uh, ideas, metaphysical ideas, uh, expressed uh, through the handwriting to express uh, the cosmological structure of the cosmos. There's a detail of the vault in the nave where you can see the liernes better. The intersections are covered by bosses with the foliate designs. And then you have the bundles of tiercerons. <clears throat> Another <clears throat> development is the umbrella vault which appears in the cloister, which consists of a, a bundle of columns with ribs springing from it. Uh, this is the first appearance of uh, this form in architecture also. The cloister is where uh, the uh, clergy would meet, and they would sit on those benches there under the arches. <clears throat> we had a few dinners in there uh, when we had conferences at the university, so that was always uh, fun. It's a detail of the umbrella ball. The uh, or not the uh, cloister, sorry, the chapter house is is this thing where the uh, uh, clergy meet. There's a, a famous scene in the Da Vinci Code that takes place uh, in the chapter house there. And then outside the chapter house is the cloister uh, with a library from the Renaissance designed by Christopher Wren, the great Renaissance architect. And then the uh, the cloister has the uh, oldest surviving wooden uh, vaults in English Gothic architecture. As I mentioned, the monasteries were destroyed by Henry VIII, so there are no monasteries there, but they're still cloisters. They still like to have cloisters. Uh, cloisters are supposed to be you know, where the monks exercise, but since there's no monks <clears throat> and no monasteries, the, the cloister might seem to be superfluous, but they still like them. There's an image of Robert Gross Test in the uh, stained glass window. He wrote an important commentary on Aristotle, the uh, commentary on the posterior analytics. Uh, he is considered to be the father of natural philosophy. Uh, he was connected to the Franciscan school at Oxford. Uh, people, some people even think that he anticipated the Big Bang Theory. There's a project at Durham Cathedral currently trying to prove that. Uh, he had a lot of influential followers, uh, including uh, uh, Bacon and Wycliffe uh, and Peckham uh, at Oxford University. There's his tomb in Lincoln Cathedral. There's me wandering around the cathedral, uh, wondering about all this stuff. Uh, Thomas Aquinas is the main figure in scholasticism. He wrote the most famous uh, Summa, the Summa Theologica, Thomas Aquinas is about a hundred years after Robert Gross Test. Uh, so there's a, there's Thomas Aquinas with uh, Aristotle on the left and Plato on the right, uh, his friends, and then the Arabic, uh, Arabic philosopher Avicenna down below, who he disagreed with. Uh, so Thomas Aquinas is a hundred years uh, after Gross Test. Uh, he's the figure most associated with what's called the Great Synthesis. The Great Synthesis was the intellectual project in the Middle Ages to attempt to synthesize or reconcile classical philosophy with Catholic theology. Uh, so that's what the Summa Theologica is. Uh, Thomas Aquinas' summary of theology uh, is an attempt to uh, combine uh, faith and reason and to provide a rational proof of God. Uh, in a lot of ways, Gross Test, who was a hundred years before this, anticipated the Great Synthesis. Gross Test also incorporated Aristotle and Plato uh, into his writings. He also attempted to synthesize uh, faith and reason or classical philosophy and Catholic theology. Uh, and I think that goes, the great synthesis goes a long way towards explaining the architecture, the Gothic architecture also. That it is both a, an expression of religious belief but also a classical philosophical reason and logic and cosmology. Uh, Thomas Aquinas uh, went to school at Monte Cassino in southern Italy. His, in Ita he's Italian. His name is Tommaso d'Aquino. Uh, 
or Thomas Aquinas in English. Aquino is just north of Naples, right near Monte Cassino, Cassino uh, the great uh, uh, Benedictine monastery established by St. Benedict. The Benedictines were the first uh, major educational order of the Catholic Church in the Middle Ages. Right about the time of Thomas Aquinas, they started to dissolve and were replaced by the Franciscans, founded by St. Francis, and the Dominicans, founded by St. Dominic. Thomas Aquinas went to this Benedictine school, but he became a Dominican and left for Paris. Robert Gross Tess was associated with the Franciscans. There's a uh, meeting house right in front of the cathedral. Uh, we had some conferences there. Uh, that's Nick Temple uh, talking to a few people. Nick Temple was the uh, director of the program at Lincoln. We had been friends for several years, and he's the person that uh, hired me uh, as a research professor at Lincoln. Uh, so, and we uh, have collaborated on a number of projects. Uh, I saw him most recently last uh, November in uh, Dundee. So that was uh, very, very enjoyable to see him there. Uh, so that's uh, the book that I published that uh, summarized the research that I had done and the conclusion that I had come to that uh, the explanation for these unprecedented forms uh, is that we're looking at a catechism of a cosmology. So the title of the book is Architecture is Cosmology, Lincoln Cathedral and English Gothic Architecture. Uh, I also, since I had invested so much in the philosophy of gross test, I published another book with the same picture on the cover, The Nave at Lincoln, called Robert Gross Test, Philosophy of Intellect and Vision. Uh, and then Nick and I and uh, a friend named Kristen Frost uh, uh, published, uh, co-edited a, a book from the conference at Lincoln called Bishop Robert Gross Test and Lincoln Cathedral, Tracing Relationships Between Medieval Concepts of Order and Built Form. So uh, that concludes the section on the Gothic, uh, the last of the terms for test number one. So we have the review to do. Uh, I'd like to, to do uh, a slideshow on uh, the English Gothic architecture uh, that uh, shows the influence of Lincoln just as another uh, extra uh, to kill some time, as it were. So I'll do that, and then we'll do a review number one for the test.